Awesome job as always, Chris and Brandon. You know, for such a small church, we got a lot of talent in this church to bring, and uh, the Lord is good. He will supply. I've been in churches a lot bigger than this and not have near the good singing and drumming. And so it's a blessing to have people lead the worship for us and, and praising God. Uh, we're going to open up today to, uh, where are we going to go first? Philippians chapter 3. Uh, this is just kind of a, a verse about the story we're going to talk about. But you gotta have find find something to open us up. But Philippians, Philippians chapter three, uh, many walk. Now tell you, I tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is in their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind er, earthly things. And the key right here in verse twenty. For our, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, let me pray with us real quick. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We ask you, Lord God, to uh, the things we walked in with today, Lord God, that may be wearing us down, weighing us down and vexing us. Lord God, that's been put on us from the world all week long. Lord we, God, we just ask you to lift that weight this morning, if only just for a moment, to keep our focus on you, Lord God, that you may do your work through our ears this morning, through the reading of your word, and that your Holy Spirit visits us and moves in our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. This morning we had a little, had some conversation, and I was talk, talking to Chris. I said, oh, I think that's DC talk. He was like, looked at me, not to put you on the spot. <laughs> I already did it once. DC Talk. I said, man, you got to know DC Talk. And uh, somebody said, who was it? Was it, uh, who said something about the Jesus freaks? Who mentioned the freaks right here? Teresa. Jenny. My gosh, I called him, uh, I called you Zach or I called him Brandon or I'm all mixed up with names today. That's what it was. After the second song, I'm like, huh? He's looking at me all confused. After the second song, I'm like, well, surely he knows. Like, sometimes we open the service after the second song, and he's looking at me confused. I'm like, Brandon's going to open the service after the second song. Still looking at me confused. He's like, you mean Zach? That's right. <laughs> Zach, I'm terrible with names. I promise I know you, Jenny. It's just something happened in the womb, or I don't know, something I did messed that little connection up. Looking at the Google. <laughs> Trace at the, at the Mormon church. <laughs> Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> anyway, the point is, a bunch of freaks is the point. We're freaks. But it used to be not very long ago. I mean, this is the 90s. This isn't the 90s. But in the 90s, DC Talk was a big name. And they had a song about the Jesus freaks. And it used to be Christians were proud of that. Like, we are different. People look at us like somebody in this room just don't fit. We were the Jesus freaks. It goes all the way back to uh, the Elton John. He talked about the, the Jesus freaks standing out there. And, and it's today, it's like we want to morph into being more palatable to the world. We want to get rid of the freak name. We're, we're just a follower of Jesus. We love you. We're down with you, man. Whatever you want to do is cool. Whatever I want to do is cool. Be more palatable. You turn on any of the church channels now or go to most churches, it's the things that want to make the world more comfortable yeah. with Jesus. Jesus is cool. Come on in. It's no different than what you'd go out and do on a Friday night. But we got to get back to the Word. A little bit more about this. You know, my, my great great grandmother, she was saved a man named Billy Sunday. You ever heard of Billy Sunday? He was born to be a preacher. With the last name Sunday, I mean, how could you not be a preacher? Billy Sunday, and he would get up there and rail against sin. He'd have these tent revivals, and it'd be full of people to come and get their feet stomped on. You know, what has changed? You rarely see that now. Not that I'm planning to get up here and rail against sin and, and tell you all what, I, what you're doing wrong and what I'm doing right. That isn't what it's about. 
but preaching from the Word of God that we are to be different. We are to be looked at as weird. We are to be looked at as aliens in a strange land. We are to feel like we don't belong in this place. We're supposed to feel like we belong in this place. But as we walk out them doors, we realize we step back into a strange place where I don't feel at home anymore. It's because the Bible says we are citizens not of this place. The Bible is so clear that our citizenship is in heaven, praise the Lord. It's not here. No matter what you want to get out your wallet or your purse and look at that ID and it says, I am legal, I'm a legal driver in the state of Ohio. And it's funny, my, my uh, good friend Ryan, we went up to, to Canada. We were 19 years old. And as we're coming back across the line, you know, we're nervous because we went up there to go to the casino. <laughs> when you're 19, you can go up there and gamble. And we go up there and we're headed back and Ryan's driving. And Ryan's kind of an awkward fellow, you know. He's kind of like, you don't know when he's supposed to say this. He says something off the wall, you know. He's been my best friend for as far back fifth grade, you know. And as we're coming through there, we've put this all on Ryan to get us back across the border. And the first question they, they ask is, what is your citizenship? And, you know, country, good old country boy, Ryan, he says, Ohio, <laughs> Ohio. <laughs> he said, pull over there, boys. You know, we just looked guilty. And we weren't really too guilty. We were guilty to our parents because they had no idea. They thought we were going to Michigan to get a new tire change for my friend because it was a better deal on tires. We were going across the border to do some gambling. And, you know, not to talk about myself too much, but it's a funny story because Ryan, good old boy, Ryan, who has his citizenship in Ohio, he didn't gamble either. He just went, went along with us. He just wanted to go hang out. But right before we left, as I lost all my money, my friend Cole lost his all, all his money. My buddy, Cole's buddy from Michigan that we picked up, that actually did sell us tires. We weren't telling a total lie. <laughs> there was tires involved. He lost all his money. My buddy Ryan put that quarter in that slot machine. And would you believe he won $150? The only quarter he spent, the only guy that didn't play in the game was the only one that won. But... To be confused with your citizenship is a serious thing. We got to know where we belong. We got to know where our name is written. And if you are a child of God, and I'm not saying on the general sense that we're created by God, all men and women are created by God, formed in the womb. But if you are a child of God, saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, the blood that shed down, on the cross and landed on you because of the choice you've made to trust in him, your citizenship today, right now, is not in this world anymore. It's in heaven. We need to start living like it. We need to start realizing, hey, I don't feel comfortable in this world, but that's all right because Jesus said I'm not supposed to feel comfortable in this world. I want to tell you a story about a man who made a choice and he's got clear steps of his fall, six steps of his falling back into the world. We'll go to Genesis chapter 13. I know many of us are familiar with this story. Uh, it's about Lot. Genesis chapter 13. I'm not going to wear us out with reading this whole story. It's a good one to go home and read. If you've already heard it, read it again. If you've never heard it, read it for the first time and study it out all this week, because it's a remarkable story. But Genesis chapter 13, give you a little intro. You had Abraham, and you had his nephew, Lot. And these two men, they had been rescued out of a foreign land that wasn't created for them, called Egypt. You know, where you see the pyramids and hieroglyphs and all that. It was an amazing civilization. It was booming with wealth. You've heard it said, there's corn there in Egypt. If you needed something, you went to Egypt. It was booming. It was like I said, it had all these great things, but it was a horrible place at the same time of immorality. And they were rescued from this place, Abraham and his nephew Lot. And then they grew up to have these uh, their own people living together. Abraham had a whole bunch of people, had cattle, had livestock, and Lot had the same. They had it all. You look out and you say, wow, look at this amazing civilization that's been rescued. Their uh, 
genealogy of being stuck in slavery. But now you see these people, Abraham's and Lot, and they get it. They didn't get along. Their people, is, the Bible says that their herdmen, their herdsmen, were in strife. They were contending. And Abraham come to Lot and he said, "You know what? Our people no longer get along. We need to separate a little bit." And that's where we get up to this point. They're kind of traveling around. They got thousands. I don't know, maybe millions of people. I'm not really sure how many. Maybe Brandon could tell us. <laughs> He's our scholar of the room, like I said. <laughs> He's like, where did I? Where do you get that? He likes these Old Testament deep things about it. But chapter 13 of Genesis. And Abraham and Abram, the Bible says, went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all he had, and Lot, his nephew, with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south even to Beth El, which means the house of God. It was a good place unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hiel, and Hai, Bethel and Hai. Bethel was the house of God. Hai was the place of ruins. It's a clear example of a good place and an evil place. Verse 4, unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord, and Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to hear them, that they might dwell together, to bear them, that they might dwell together. For their substance was great, so that, so that they could not dwell together. Verse 7, and there was a strife. This is the first step in Lot's downward course. First step, you know, anybody know... If you look back different things in your life, you know, you've dipped into sin or started walking down a play, way you shouldn't go. There's a first step every time, isn't there? You can look back and say, well, if I'm honest with myself, I can look back and remember that first step. And if you don't ask God, he will show you. Well, remember that first step. That's where it started. This is where it first started, a strife between Abram and Lot. There was a strife. There was contention. There is a problem between the spiritual man. There's a symbol here between the spiritual man of Abram, the man that wanted to live for God, that was so comfortable, loved to be in Bethel, the, the house of God. There was a strife between him and the carnal man, Lot, who wanted to live for himself, who wanted to just whatever he saw that would fill his need at the very moment. That's the place he was headed in. The first step, there's a strife between the carnal man in the spiritual man. Our first step down into sin, there's a strife, there's a contention between what God wants for your life and what the enemy wants for your life. Or if yourself is the enemy of God, what you want for your life. And it goes on after that first step, verse, let's read that again, verse seven. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and these, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Really, it was an uncle and a nephew. But they were very close. Verse 9, Is not the whole land before thee? Abram's talking to Lot. He's laying this out for him. We need to separate our people. There's too much fighting and fighting. We need to go our separate ways so that you and I can keep a good relationship. Is not the whole land before thee, Lot? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. He's giving the choice. See, now there's a choice to be made. It was laid out clearly before Lot. Abram gave him the opportunity. Have you seen that in your life? A clear choice. God will lay it out before you. This is your two choices. Sometimes it's not so clear, right? But many times it's very clear, as it was here before Lot. If you go to the left, Lot, I'll go to the right. It's up to you. If you go right, I'll go left. Is not the whole land before thee. You go left, I go right. I, you go right, I go left. And Lot lifted up his eyes 
And this is his second step of his downward spiral into sin. He lifted up his eyes and beheld the plain of Jordan. He did an inspection. He saw the house of Bethel, the house of God, good place, godly place. But he looked out and he did an assessment of an evil place too. He looked out over all of it and he had to make this important choice for himself and his people. The second step of his downward spiral into sin was he beheld. Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere. Be, now listen, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. So he looked out and he saw, we're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, what he looked at. If you, if you are familiar with the Bible whatsoever, and you think about an evil place that the Bible mentions, or you think about any type of evil, you think, you've probably heard it say, well, that's, that's like Sodom and Gomorrah. We're living in the days like Sodom and Gomorrah. We are living in the days like Sodom and Gomorrah. I want to share a little bit about that with you too this morning. But he beheld, he made a clear choice. That's the easy way. It's flowing with clean water. My crops will grow easy. There's plenty of food. It's evil, but I'm going to choose it. He wanted to fill his immediate need. He beheld was his second step. Did you know that sin will take you, always take you farther than you want to go and keep you longer than you planned to stay? Every time. It will take you further than you want to go, will keep you longer than you want to stay. Maybe Lot, he was a righteous man. The Bible is clear. He was a good man like Abram. Maybe he thought, I'll just dabble in there a little while. I'll take my people there. I'll get enough wealth to go back to Bethel or go back to a good place. Or maybe I'll change the place. Maybe I'll take my people and we'll, have, we'll do so good. We'll be so fortunate. We'll make Sodom for God. That rarely ever works. It rarely ever works that you're going to take your good into a bad place and change it for the good. I'm not saying Lot had that in mind, but maybe he did. The problem was he had a desire for Sodom. He had a desire for it. And he was speaking to his own desires and his actions, his steps led him right to it. The men of Sodom were wicked. They were sinners exceedingly. The lot desired after the world. This plain as he beheld, he looked out, he did his assessment. It seemed to offer him what he needed right then and there. He had a need and he saw that will fill my need right here, right now. We should, you know, we should be the most careful during the driest times of our lives. When we think we're in the driest place, I am so desperate. I need a savior right now. I may not be able to pay this bill this month. I may be losing this relationship. I am desperate. What am I going to do? Dry places in life. Right then is when we should be the most careful because the enemy will present to you a tailor-made temptation that will appear to fill your need at that very moment. It is the truth. We have to be careful. Like I said at the beginning, we are a citizen of heaven. We need to realize I do not belong in this place. I have a better place for me. I'm just bearing with this place long enough for my Savior to return. I remember uh, hearing about a preacher, his, his name, well, I read it, his name was Martin Lloyd-Jones. He said that I used to go to a church with my wife. It was her grandfather's church. He said that this place was amazing. The, the town was so full of sin, but the people went to church. They almost went there for entertainment to mock the preacher. He said that this building, this church was built in such a way that there was a little bridge, like a little parapet that come out above the congregation and it went straight to the back door so the preacher would literally walk in the back door rail against sin tell them how evil they were preach the word of god and then jet out the back door because he'd make the people so mad <laughs> you know, we need those days back not that you're going out, you go out and tell everybody how bad they are but the word of god offends it is the truth. Like I said at the beginning, you need to be looked at as a stranger. You need to be looked at as an alien. You need to be looked at as you go into a place of the world that you don't belong here. 
The Bible is so clear all throughout the page after page. It, it, uh, like Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. He didn't say I didn't come to bring peace, but he brought what? Like a sword to split it asunder one way and another from the world and ye. He said, that's the world. That is they, but ye, but ye are not of this world. We see the language all through the Bible. Galatians says, and because ye are sons, and women, you're not outside of this. You are sons. That's just biblical language saying sons and daughters. You are sons. God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. In 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote, examine yourselves. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Is Jesus Christ in you? I'm going to ask you this morning, is Jesus Christ in you? Answer yourself that. I don't want you to answer it out loud. I don't need to hear it. You need to hear it. Examine yourself. Am I in Christ and is Christ in me? And to the Romans, Paul wrote, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Does the Spirit of God dwell in you? Praise the Lord. It's an awesome thing to know without a doubt. My citizenship is in heaven and his citizenship getting me to heaven is in me. He lives in me. He dwells in me. My strength is found in him. Our Lord was very clear and plain about his teachings about the believer and the world. A separate thing. Even when the world takes down a wall, the true Christians respect the walls that God has ordained for his people. Remember reading about a back in the, the, the Berlin Wall, I believe it was, went all through this land and you had the red stag that for decades had made its trails along that wall. Had For decades had made its trails along that wall. They took down the wall, cleared the land, and for decades up to this day, the red stag still travels those same trails it made when the wall was there. Instead of going straight through that wall that's no longer there, it'll go longer to go down the trail that its parents and its grandparents and its grandparents made. Does the world take down a wall only for you to... No, does the world put up a wall only for you to take it back down? Does the church, does your church family put up a wall you know, what's the point of coming to church? I told my wife this a few weeks ago. You know, when I was struggling, I was struggling and preaching and different things. You know, preachers struggles a lot. <laughs> I'm sure worship leaders do. You know, yeah. the enemy will bring, Zach, am I right? The enemy will bring these doubts into your mind and tell you why you're wasting your time. Why are you doing this? What's the point of it all? But the point of being here this morning is to hear something from the word of God, from an imperfect man about a perfect man that will change your life. That's the only reason to come here this morning. To come here, fellowship, love your brother and sister in Christ, to be with people of like mind, but that's a social part of it. What we come here this morning is to hear from an imperfect man, from a perfect word, speaking from a perfect man in heaven, what can change you today? Go out of this place remembering that I don't belong out there, but I have to bear with it out there for another week until next Sunday. And I'm rejuvenated again. I'm going to hear the truth. I'm going to come in and I'm going to hear the word of God and I'm going to leave changed for the better. I know I've said it before, but one preacher said, I don't really care how you leave, but I want you to leave changed. You can leave mad, sad, or glad, but leave changed from where you came in. We're constantly getting better and not better. We're going from glory to glory. Praise the Lord, preparing ourselves for heaven. That's what it's all about. I know one preacher, he said, my grandmother, she, sometimes she would look out the window. You'd walk in her house, she'd have a pot of beans on or be cooking something, but she'd be looking out the window and you, she'd almost do it on purpose. Well, man, what are you looking at? I'm just seeing if our Lord's returning yet. Do we keep our eye out the window? Are we waiting? Are we, are we waiting for the Lord earnestly, Lord, we want you to return. I'm tired of living in this place. I know I have to live. I have to do your word, do your work in, in this world to be your hands and feet. But Lord, I want you to return. Or are you so comfortable that, God, I got some things I want to do. 
I know you got this plan to send back your son, but there's some things I need to accomplish in my life before you accomplish your will in this world. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? There's good things in this life. You can be a good friend to somebody. You can have fun with somebody. You experience new things. You can be a father or a mother. Or in, in this example, Abram with his nephew Lot, you can be a good uncle, an aunt. You can be an amazing, do amazing things. And even through all them great things that we can experience in life, we don't feel at home. It was good. But as I lay my head down to sleep tonight, it was a good day. But Lord, will you come back soon? Because I don't feel at home in this land anymore. The word tells us the world cannot hate you. But this is Jesus. The world cannot hate you, but me it hates because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. You're a, you are a Jesus freak. <laughs> You're not afraid to say, this is evil. I'm not going to be a part of it anymore. But it's just, you know, it's a work thing. You know, just come with us. You don't have to have a drink. You don't have to do these things. Just come hang out. We work together. Let's do this. No, I'm sorry. Well, I'm not sorry. <laughs> I won't be attending because a house divided, the Bible says a house divided against itself cannot stand. Praise the Lord. And John, he says, if the world hates you, man, that's tough right there. Who wants to be hated? I, I don't want to be hated. I want people to love me. I want people to like me, like being around me. But the Bible says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me first. Jesus says that. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. If you're of the world, the world loves you. They love you. But because you're not of this world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. They might bear with you for a moment. They might let you bump your gums about Jesus here and then. But when you turn your back, they're mocking you for it. I can promise you that. I've been a witness of it. Actually, I've heard it firsthand behind my own back when they didn't think I was listening. They'll let you, they'll listen to you about Jesus just long enough for you to leave and talk about you being a Jesus freak. Have the lines been blurred? Have the lines been blurred between your citizenship in heaven and your citizenship in the world? Have you started to take steps that blur those lines like Lot did? I got to move on because we don't have too much time. Um, back, to, back to Genesis 13 about Lot. I hope I didn't lose you on, on my ramblings there. But the third step, are you with me about Lot? First, he, he had strife between good and evil, the carnal man and the spiritual man. And he separated, he, he beheld the land and he made his choice. And we get to number three, he chose. He chose, he made a choice. Verse 11 says, Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. What choices are you making in your life? You need to adopt right now a biblical view of the world. Before you leave here today, I want you to ask God, what is the view, is my view of the world your view of the world? As I go back into that place, as I go back to sojourn with them, them, remember, there's the them and there's the ye. There's the them, the world, and the Bible says the ye. I know that's King James language, but he makes a clear separation. And if you don't have a clear view of the world based on the Bible and based on God, you will never live in peace. You will constantly have this strife between good and evil. We all will. We got to deal with it but there's got to be the right viewpoint. Especially if there's a major life change. You know, I'm not like a prophet. I'm not going to get up here and say, somebody in this room's getting ready to make it. I could say that and everybody, there'd be, everybody in this room would say, man, he hears straight from God. Somebody in this room's getting ready to make a major life change. And they're getting ready to make it for their family. If you're getting ready to make a major life change and for your family, you need to do like Lot did and make an assessment to look out among your choices and say, God, my viewpoint is marred. 
My eye gate is not strong. My ear gate, and that may not make sense quite yet because there's another part of this story, is damaged. I need to hear from you. Which way do I need to go? And that is talking about prayer. Now, I've sit, sat through a lot of sermons that bored the daylights out of me about prayer. I'm going to be honest with you. When a preacher gets up there, he's going to preach about prayer for an hour. He got me at first, but then it just gets, it gets bored, boring after a while, you know? Some, pe some people say, well, prayer's tough. I don't understand it. I'm talking to the air. You know, I'm just talking to the air, waiting. He's not going to, I'm not going to hear something back. But it's clear, if you have experienced prayer, like I said, I'm not going to dwell on this too long, but if you are a man or a woman of God that has experienced prayer, it's not hard. All you got to do is try it. If you've been silent with God for weeks on end, I feel like I've been so busy lately that I, I, last night I'm preparing for this message and I, I was lost. I mean, all day I'm listening to sermons. I'm trying to get my mind on God and I couldn't. And it was last night about midnight. I remembered I have a God. I remembered I need to pray about this. And I did. And I prayed, God, will you, will you give me the message, Lord God? I've, 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 I've had struggles all day long talking what I'm going to preach. I pray he gives it to you. It's, it's really simple. People think oh, it's hard to pray, you know. No, it's not. Just do it. Talk to him. It can be in your head or more. It, it's even better to speak audibly to him. My mom, she, she always, so many times she tells me this, and she knows she's told me it before, and I want her to keep telling me it's so we don't forget my grandma did the same thing with me. She'd tell me story after story. She told me 10 times, but I'm glad now she did because I'm not going to forget it. She said, I was saved as a little girl in my prayer closet. She said her, her aunt, I believe it was her aunt, would tell me, if you want to get to know Jesus, if you want to get saved, go into your prayer closet. And she literally did that. She, she said, I remember going into the closet among the clothes and shutting the door and it was dark and I prayed to God and I was saved. It wasn't some preacher calling her to the front. And, you know, that's awesome too. If you want to come up to the front after this service, please do. That's the, num that's the best thing a preacher can ever witness to be a part of somebody's salvation. But if you're not comfortable with that, go home tonight, get into your prayer closet or on your way home in your car. You know, the car can be the most awesome ex spiritual experience you ever experienced. Put on that spiritual music, man. Put on that Christian station. When you're by yourself, just praise in the Lord. Has anybody ever experienced that? Anybody do that regularly? It's awesome. It's a prayer closet. To pray to God is the number one thing you can do to get you through, to bring you peace. Some of the most deepest, darkest places in my life I've ever been to. Why do I wait? Why? We wait so long till the last option. To, oh, yeah. Maybe I should pray about this. This is a tough decision. What are we going to do? We got to research. We got to see where we're going to go with this. Talking it over with your spouse. All these hard decisions. Oh, yeah. Let's pray. My wife and I, we've prayed together. It's kind of an awkward thing. <laughs> you know, I could probably, she, we could probably count on one hand, uh, just being honest. That's tough to pray with your spouse but it's the most powerful thing you could ever do or pray for your spouse. If you see your spouse going through a tough time, just to pray for them. Even if it's silent, and they don't know you're doing it. It is an awesome thing. And God will honor that. I don't know how I got on that course. <laughs> There's a choice to be made and lot made that choice. I want to get back to it this morning as lot made this, this descending journey and to sin. You know, he sees Sodom there, but it's, it's evil, but it's got some good things to me to fill the need in this very moment. He made a choice and he didn't move. He did not move into Sodom immediately. The Bible says, and this is awesome. He pitched toward it. Chapter 13, Abram, chapter 13, verse 12, Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain. So he's like just outside of Sodom and pitched his tent toward Sodom. Full view of it. You know, when you put yourself in the viewpoint of the world, and I've said this a little bit, I said this a little bit ago too. You put yourself in the viewpoint, you're not in it, 
but you're viewing it. That's your viewport. Chris, that may be language for you. I don't know what the virus is. So there's a viewport, right? What, you, what you're viewing. I think that's computer language. If you put your viewport port there, the world, it won't be long before Satan makes a tailor-made temptation for you. Tailor-made. I'm just watching the world. I can see it, but I'm strong enough. I'm a strong enough Christian not to be part of it. I'm just going to pitch my tent toward it, be a little entertained. You can. There's a lot of application for that. That can be your TV. That can be your Spotify. That can be anything. You are pitching your tent toward Sodom. Won't be long. Satan will come right along with a tailor-made temptation made for you. Lot journeyed east from Bethel, the house of God, and towards ruin and catastrophe. On the appearance, it looked like a land flowing with milk and honey. Perfect place for him and his herdmen and all his cattle. But inwardly, it was devouring him, as we'll see. While Abram, Abraham is staying by Bethel, the house of God, Lot did not take up residence in Sodom right away, did he? He pitched his tent toward it. He viewed it for a while. I ask you this morning again, which direction are you headed in? And then once you answer yourself that, once you answer yourself that, you're going to get a lot more honest answer when you go home tonight and ask your spouse that. <laughs> you say, honey, which direction am I headed with, headed in? First, they're going to look at you confused. Maybe not some of you that have them <laughs> you know, here this morning, but it's confusing. What do you mean, which, which direction am, are you headed in? Which direction am I headed in spiritually? The choices I've made over the last year, honey, they will. Is it not the truth, Zach? Your spouse will give you the most honest answer of anybody in your life. I know that's true for me. <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but ask them that. I think I'm doing pretty good. I want you to, I'm not going to get mad at you. Tell me the truth. Which direction am I headed in spiritually? The choices I've made over the last year. She'll tell you the truth. And then ask, if you got kids, ask your kids that. Kids, which direction am I headed in? Now, my little kids, they'd probably look at me, what are you talking about, Dad? You're walking toward, toward the barn. You're walking toward church. You're walking toward that. Which direction am I being more for God or more for the world? And they'll give you the honest answer. Sometimes it, it takes not looking, Pastor Dave talked about last week, looking into the mirror. That's incredibly important. To look into the mirror, your own observation of yourself, lay your life out. But sometimes it takes looking into the eyes of somebody that knows you, really knows you and loves you and wants the best things for you. It can be your, a very good friend. That's a Christian friend. Obviously, you're not going to go to the worldly friend. Am I going in the right direction? No, man, you're not. We got to go do this tonight. Ask somebody that you can trust, that you know trust Jesus, and they will give you an honest answer and an honest assessment. But the other part of that is don't get mad at them. You're asking for a reason because it's never too late. You know, the Bible is full of new beginnings. If you find yourself headed in the wrong direction this morning or already in that place, not only pitched your tent toward it, but living in it, which we're going to talk about here in a second, it's never too late to get up and move. Never too late to get up and move. It's never too late to start walking the other way back to the cross. God shows himself more than any time in your life when you do that. He will show himself to you when you're doing right, doing right, but he loves a new beginning. The Bible began with it. He was hovering over those waters and he, he saw what the Bible says, a place of void. It was a place of destruction. I'm not getting on that. And he started creating this new beginning, praise the Lord. And he does it over our lives. He will hover over you the same way he hovered over those waters and start to create things that you didn't even know were there and do things in your life and mold you. The preacher said, I never really understood God until I sat there and I watched a potter at the wheel. You'll never understand God until you sit there and look at him as a potter at the wheel. My life in his hands as that thing's spinning and it gets out of control. All of a sudden, there's a point where it can't just be fixed. There's a point where he's got to take that lump of clay, crush it up, throw it on the ground, get a new lump of clay and start spinning it new in your life, a new beginning. Praise the Lord. Got to move on. Lot, his next step, his fifth step, there's only six, so I'm not going to keep you too long. He dwelt in. See, he started to pitch toward his pitching their tents, you know, all the herdsmen, all the cattle. They're out here. They're not in Sodom, but they're looking at it. And they're looking at it and they're looking at it. I know there's a comedian recently. Uh, it's really funny if you haven't looked it, look it up. Just look at it. And he said, would you just look at it? <laughs> Have you seen that? 
But they're looking at it, and it made a major change because not long, for chapter 14, verse 12, and they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt. All of a sudden, he's found dwelling in the land, dwelling in Sodom and in all his goods. It won't be long for you to move from pitching towards it to pitching in it. It's the nature of compromise. You start to live a little bit of it, dabbling in it, befriending certain people. Well, I'm going to do some good in their life. No, it, it, you may do some good, but if you got this in your mind, but I, I'm not going to offend them or anything. They're just going to hang out with me long enough that I, I'm aware on them. No, the Bible says that Lot was vexed. He was a righteous man. It's clear even in all through the New Testament. It speaks of Lot different times. He was a righteous man. He was a, he was a God man. God man, like God loved him. He, he chose him as his son. He had salvation. So these things he was seeing and these things he was hearing vexed him. It wore him down. Sodom will war, wear you down. You can't put a guarantee on how far you will go when you start giving up on victory ground. That is the truth. If, the, if God starts rescuing you, rescuing you in your life or rescuing your marriage or your relationships with your parents or your siblings, whatever he's done for you in your life to make you a better man or a woman, to show your citizenship is in heaven, if you start giving up on victory ground, you're just slipping back into Sodom. Well, I'm just going to give up. on it's, it's only, you know, I got all this land. If I just give him a little bit, give the enemy a little bit, it's not long. You cannot guarantee how much will be gone. You cannot guarantee how much will slip away. Like I said earlier, <clears throat> sin will always take you further than you want to go, and it will keep you longer than you want to stay. And this is the final step of Lot's dissension into sin and his life. And this is tough for Lot, all these choices he made. The Bible says that he sat in its gate. He sat in the gate of Sodom as a judge, a ruler, and a citizen. He changed his citizenship. He was a citizen of Sodom and Gomorrah. Chapter 19, 1. There's a story I want to tell you real quick. Genesis chapter 19, 1. He's standing in this gate, this amazing thing. He's seeing everybody come and go out of Sodom. He's a judge. He's like a, he's like a congressman, I guess. I don't know. He's a, he's a judge. He's able to, he has some control over the place now. And there came two angels to Sodom at evening. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. These are two angels. This is wild, but it's the truth. There's angels walking up here to the gate. And Lot rose up, seeing them, to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. I did a little research on that. I'm not going to wear you out. But it wasn't just like an honorary bow. He put his face to the ground in shame. These are two angels. Spiritual forces walking up into this place. He put his face to the ground, and he said, Behold now, my lords. Turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house and tarry all night and wash your feet and you shall rise up early and go on your ways. This is weird. This is two angels he's talking to. And they said, no, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly and they turned in unto him and entered into his house and he made them a feast and did take unleavened bread and they did eat. But before they laid down, this is just to give you a description of this place. But before they laid down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house around, both old and young. You got this gang of men, old men, young men, went around this house. All the people from every quarter. This is, this is crazy. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are those men which came in to thee that last night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And that, by, that means they, they may rape them. That's how evil this place was. We saw two men walk up in here, and you let them stay in there last night. Bring them out here so that we may know them. And Lot went out of the door unto them and shut the door after them. So he comes out. He, he shuts the door real quick, keeping the men, his 
you know, these angels are in the house. It's, that's wild, ain't it? But it was. And they called on Lot and said this, and Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren. He calls them brethren. These rapists outside of his house, all of a sudden he's pitching toward the place. He's living in the place. He's a, he's a judge at the gate. He's seeing everything coming and going into his eyes, into his ears. I pray you, brethren, do not do this wicked thing. Do not so wickedly. So if you think it's just they wanted to meet him, it wasn't. They just want to meet them. It was a wicked thing they were wanting to do to them. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known a man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you. And do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. And they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came in to sojourn and he will need a judge. Now will we deal worse than with thee, worse with thee than with them? And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break down the door. Evil. It was an evil generation. They were so desperate to get a hold of these two new men. This, this, is, a, this is the kind of thing that this, this world's headed in. If you don't think that, then you are too comfortable in this world. Sodom. There's a reason why, you know, you get the term sodomite. I mean, I'm just saying it what it is. That's, that's, where, that's where the term comes from. You know, sodomy, sodomite, all that evil stuff. And I'm not going to go into all of that. But it, Sodom began with, you know, pride. It was a prideful thing. This place began to, everything that they did, it was the pursuit of feeding the flesh. Pursuit of pleasure. That's what Sodom was all about. And there's no, there's no, like I said, I'm not going to get on this path too long, but there's no uh, doubt why all the way from Clinton, including Trump to today, the month of June is called Pride Month. There's a reason. It goes all the way back to Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a total mockery of the Word of God. It's a total mockery of the plan of God. It's a total perversion of the plan of God, and they name it Pride. It's no doubt, and they use the rainbow. There's a reason for that. It's mockery of the word of God. And it's a sad state of affairs, especially for the church, if all of a sudden we forget that God speaks to us as ye, and he speaks to them as they. There's a clear separation. There should be a difference. And I'm going to end with this. 1 John chapter 4. Verse four through six. I'm gonna speak. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna read this in a certain way. Ye are of God. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. You see the clear distinction, clear separation. They are of the world. Therefore, speak they of the world and the world heareth them. But we are of God. We are of God. We're Jesus freaks. <laughs> Just got to face it and accept it. We're different. Our citizenship is not here. We are supposed to feel a little uncomfortable when we go into the world. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we, the spirit of truth, in the spirit of error. There's a reason why the blood, the cross is such, to us it's beautiful. You see, the, if you're a saved man or a woman of God and you know the power of the blood and you look at the cross, it's, it's beautiful. If it had blood stains on it, you'd say it's even more beautiful. If it had a, a uh, crown of thorns on the top of it, you'd say, wow, it's extremely beautiful. The worse it looks, the more beautiful it is for us because it's what Jesus went through for us. But to the world, it's a reproach. To the world, that's a disgusting thing. It's the lowest thing of, that man can ever come up with. And the man that died in it, 
on it, I have I don't want nothing to do with him. To thee, to ye, <laughs> not trying to start talking King James language, but it's clear to ye, to me, to you, to us, we love God. We love his plan for us. We love our citizenship is there, but to the world, there's got that's all I want to if you if you don't leave with anything else today, I want you to leave with that. That there's a clear distinction between you and the world. Clear distinction. Another thing I want you to leave with today is that sin will take you further than you wanted to go and it will keep you longer than you planned to stay. That's what the whole story is about with Lot. There's a clear choice. And I, and I do challenge you today to make that, like Pastor Dave talked about last week, a self-assessment, but also tonight go home and ask your spouse. Maybe not tonight, but soon. Tonight, more, I'm going to do it. I'm going to ask her right after church. <laughs> I want it when the kids aren't around. <laughs> oh, yeah, she's getting them notes down. <laughs> He's going to ask me. I'm going to be ready. Man, is it that bad? Wow. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't mean that. Keep, the, keep no weapons in the room, uh, no ball bats. But uh, it, it's a true thing. So let me just... Ask Dewey, I asked him before the service, if you don't mind closing for it. It helps me because I can pass the baton on. He's going to close us in prayer.